We're going to aim in this presentation to talk about the structured interpretation of the chest x-rays. Uh, this is a similar presentation to the one that you will have got on the respiratory day. So uh, we're going to cover it in the A, B, C, D, E, F, G approach. Um, you have to excuse what um, explain everything has done to the um, slide here. But we start with the technicals. So it's T, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So technicals, airway, bones, cardiac, diaphragm, equal lung fields, and then the gastric area. So let's start with the technicals. Well, there's a number of issues to uh, concern ourselves with. First and foremost, is it the right way round? Um, is this chest x-ray um, the correct way round? And the way to establish that, first and foremost, is the heart border. And the heart border will normally, as in this x-ray, um, be on the left-hand side, as denoted by the, the symbol there. Um, the only time you'll find any difference there is when there is a dextrocardia, but hopefully you won't be the one to encounter that. Somebody else will have noted that already. So what else um, are we looking at as far as technicals are concerned? Well, we want to know whether the x-ray is rotated or not. Um, so the way to assess that is to look at the ends of the clavicles here and here and assess how far away they are from the um, centre of the spinous processes which are working down the middle. Are they equidistant? If they're not equidistant then the x-ray might be slightly rotated as you can see here. And if it is slightly rotated it might mean that some of the structures, for example the mediastinum, might look um, a little unusual and it might be uh, therefore harder to interpret. How well penetrated is the x-ray is the next thing that we're going to be concerned with. So um, is it under or over penetrated? Um, if it's under penetrated then you're not going to be able to see the um, cervical, uh, cervical bodies, uh, the vertebral bodies I beg your pardon. Um, and you should be able to see them all the way through the heart really, you should be able to see them. So on this one for example you can't see them at all. Um, through this area so that's probably a little under penetrated if it was over penetrated you could probably see further down um, as well so that's um, is it the right way round is there any rotation what's the penetration like and all these things you'll be expected to comment on um, when you come across x-ray interpretations the final thing you want to know is whether this is a PA or an AP x-ray so PA, posterior anterior, or AP, anterior posterior. And the first letter refers to where the x-ray is shot from. The second letter refers to where the film is. So you can see that here in this example. Um, the reason we're interested in whether it's PA or AP, because depending on how it's shot, um, can influence on the size of the heart. Um, so you can see here in the AP x-ray, where the x-rays are being shot from here through to here, um, that the heart shape is going to be larger than if it was shot as a PA x-ray from here to here. And this is correspondingly smaller. AP x-ray is generally done with the patient lying in bed. Generally the poorlier patients have an AP x-ray. Um, a PA x-ray is the one that's usually done in the department with the patient standing up with the plate in front of them. A clue as to whether it's a PA x-ray or an AP, if it's not evident on the x-ray, is that the patients during a PA x-ray are asked to lift their arms up. Um, so you may see that the scapula are lifted out of the way, which might give you another clue as to whether it's an AP or a PA x-ray. If it is an AP x-ray, one thing that you perhaps can't comment on is the size of the heart. OK, so we've done technicals, now let's move on to airway. So the first thing you want to know is, is the trachea central? Is it in the midline or has it been pushed or pulled across for one reason or another? Judging this is similar to when you're looking at the ends of the clavicles to see whether the film has been rotated or not. In this example you can see the trachea going down the middle here. And it does seem to be equidistant between the two ends of the clavicles. 
so that's a central trachea. This example here, the x-ray um, shows evidence of a pneumothorax, this area here. Um, and as a consequence, this pneumothorax has pushed the, tra the, tra the trachea across. So you can see the trachea going down here and bifurcating down there. So that trachea has been pushed across. Equally, the trachea can often be pulled across. This is a normal lung on this side now. And this is a consolidated lung here. You can see it's much more opaque. And as a consequence, the trachea is now running down here and has been pulled across in this direction. So if there's evidence that the trachea has been pushed or pulled, you need to establish why has it been pushed or pulled. What's the process that's going on? Something abnormal has happened. Having done airway, we now need to move on to B, which is for bones. So we're going to be looking at uh, all the bones we can see in a chest x-ray, the clavicles, the scapula, the head of the humerus, uh, the ribs and the uh, vertebral bodies. And you're going to be examining them for a number of things. Firstly, um, you're going to look along the line of them all to see if you can see any evidence of any fractures, which you can see here. Um, you can, if you work your way along these ribs, you can see that there's an area where there's some more calcification where old fractures have started to heal. But you're also going to be looking along the bone lines for any obvious evidence of any, say, metastatic changes or any darkened areas. One other thing you want to do is count how many ribs you can actually see. You should be able to see um, six anterior or ten posterior ribs as really a maximum. If you can see more than that, you're possibly dealing with a hyperexpanded lung, which you may expect to see um, in somebody with COPD, for example. So just to be aware of which ribs are, ri are which, these ones running along in this direction are your posterior ribs, and hopefully you'll be able to see up to ten of those as they work their way down. And then on the other aspect, you should be able to see six anterior ribs, and these are slightly harder to see, but these kind of run in this direction here. And hopefully you can see six of those. If you can see more, then possibly it's a hyper-expanded lung. So we've done A, we've done B, we started with technicals, now we're moving on to C. And C is about looking at the heart and the borders of the heart more especially. And this is where something called a silhouette sign um, can be very, very useful when diagnosing any conditions with um, your patients. So first and foremost, the edges of the heart and the mediastinum should be clear, and this is called, as I say, the silhouette sign. So this edge down here should be nice and crisp and clear on both sides. So as you can see here, you can easily distinguish the edge of the heart from the, the lungs, so it's silhouetted against the lungs. Now, if you lose that silhouette, then there's every possibility that you've got something in there that's causing that silhouette to go. So there's some fluid of some description, or there's some solid of some description. So you can see in this example here, with this right middle lobe opacity, that you can see the edge of the heart beautifully up to here. You can see it nicely down here, but you've lost it all here. And that's because of this middle lobe opacity. And that's uh, something to talk about at this point as well. If you um, are not sure what you're dealing with, consolidation or fluid or edema or whatever, and you can get away with calling it an opacity. So this area here is more opaque than the rest of the lung. So this is a right middle lobe opacity and we'll talk about the regions of the lung in a little while. This area here is a right upper lobe opacity and again you've started to lose the silhouette, the side, the borders of the heart with this opacity that's going on here. Moving on to another couple of examples referring to the silhouette sign. You can see here that this border of the heart's beautiful but then we lose it all down here so you've got a left lower lobe opacity. And again up here the border of the heart which isn't that brilliant here, but is definitely losing the silhouette sign here, so a left upper lobe opacity. So the silhouette sign is a very, very strong indicator of some pathology in the lung. The next thing you need to do is to measure the size of the heart. Now, if you remember, this is not something you can do on an AP x-ray, but only on a PA, because of the way the x-ray affects the size of the heart on an AP x-ray. But basically you want to know is the width of the heart less than half of the thorax. 
So is this distance here less than half of this distance here? If it is, that's a reasonably normal sized heart. If it's any bigger than that, you need to start commenting on an enlarged heart. So that's possibly going to increase your suspicion of somebody who's got heart failure. So having done the technicals, the airway, the bones and the cardiac elements, we move on to D, which stands for diaphragm. And the diaphragm acts in a similar way to the edge of the heart in providing the silhouette sign. So you've got two halves of the diaphragm, two hemi-diaphragms, the right side here and the left side here. And both sides should be nice and clear and crisp, as in this one. You should be able to see the nice, clear, cardiophrenic angle and then a nice, clear, costophrenic angle. The diaphragm on the right is often slightly higher than the diaphragm on the left. Um, and This is because on the right side you've got the liver underneath it and on the left side you've got the heart sitting on top. So if you use the hemidiaphragms as your reference for your silhouette sign, you can see on these two x-rays on the right hand side that that provides a reference for both these opacities that we've got. So here we've got the right lower lobe opacity. The right hemidiaphragm has almost virtually disappeared. And on the left side, we've got this right lower lobe opacity, where once again, the hemidiaphragm on this side has all but disappeared. The other thing to look for in the diaphragm, and it's a very important sign, um, and this is a bit of a blindingly obvious one, and they're often not as obvious as this, and you have to be very careful, is this area under here, which is air under the diaphragm. This is an abnormal sign under um, a diaphragm. You shouldn't have air under there. What you should have, uh, if anything, is evidence of a gastric bubble, which you've got there, and that is normal. But here you've got, clearly you've got air under this area here, um, and that is an abnormal finding. Um, and remember that you're possibly going to have a patient who's um, showing signs of air under the diaphragm. They've got an acute abdomen, and this finding may not completely surprise you. So after diaphragm, we need to look at the lung fields, or equal lung fields, E for equal lung fields. Um, and basically, you're just comparing both sides. Normally, you get these lovely markings that you can see in these reasonably healthy-looking lungs, um, almost like a marbled piece of beef. You can see the markings of, of the lungs on both sides look very equal. On this side, um, for example, you've obviously got this opacity here, which looks very different from this side here. This is a very evident example of somebody with the bat wing appearance um, of, or, the, or the butterfly wing of um, pulmonary edema, uh, which is this diffuse, fluffy effect um, that you get on both sides of the lungs. Um, again, be careful that pulmonary edema isn't always as obvious as that, um, but um, if you've got the right clinical signs and this x-ray comes up, then hopefully that will confirm your diagnosis. So the G finally just represents the um, gastric bubble, um, which is commonly seen on a chest x-ray. And that's just this fine area down here, not to be confused with air under the diaphragm. Um, sometimes it has a little fluid level in there as well, depending on whether there's actually any liquid in the, in the stomach. So just to go back over all the areas we've covered, we started with the T, which are our technicals. Then we moved on to the ABC approach, A being airway, B is bones, C is cardiac, D is diaphragm, and then E and F is equal lung fields, and then we finish with the gastric bubble. So if you work your way through all of these and try and master what each one covers, um, it's a structured way of examining the chest x-ray and hopefully you should cover everything you need to.